Hello, thank you for joining me today. Today I have a very special guest and I'm, I feel so privileged to have her with me today. Um, hello to my listeners of my podcast and hello to my um, YouTube channel, people who come here and are interested in learning about suicide and also for my odd, dear audience, the ones who have lost uh, people to suicide. So this is Actually, I believe an episode that will help both of these sides of this audience because Heidi Lindman, she's a therapist and she works in Broomfield, Colorado. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It is my privilege. Thank you. Yeah. And the reason why I wanted to talk to her and she was generous enough to do this is that one of the main questions I hear from my audience is, how can someone get to the point of suicidal ideation? And this is what we're going to focus on today. Heidi has had a history of suicidal ideation herself, and we're going to talk about that. And today she actually specializes in that. And she has patients and she helps them reframe these thoughts. So Heidi, can you please start telling us your story? How did you get here? Absolutely. So when I was 18, I lost a really dear friend of mine who was almost like a sister. Uh, she was 14 and she died one day from an overdose on pills. We don't really know if it was suicide, if she had intent. We really mm -hmm. have no idea. Yeah. She self-harm and her mom thought that maybe it was a thing that she was trying to self-harm with. And at that time, we didn't really know that you could die from taking pills, but mm -hmm. she did die. Mm -hmm. That was really hard on me and I went into a place of almost every night kind of just wishing I wouldn't wake up and I mm -hmm. would just hope that I would just not because it was really painful and I didn't really know and as an 18 year old how to deal with emotions and what what they even were and they were really intense so I was just felt like out of my mm -hmm. um, comfort zone I guess um, I was a senior in high school then too and then that the so that's passive suicidal ideation like wishing I would be dead that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and that lasted for a while for like three four years maybe and then um, I was in seminary and it was just before I was about to graduate with my master's degree that I started having active suicidal thoughts that I literally started thinking about that I want to die and that I'm mm -hmm trying to figure out a plan and I started thinking about particular ways that that could happen and that to me I think I really got there because I was scared about graduating and I was scared about not being in school I didn't know mm. how to not be a student that's the only thing I had been for mm. so many years of my life mm. uh, and it was a huge transition Mm -hmm. and I was just so scared. so it was maybe the fear of change at the time yeah it was the fear of change and it was you know there was other pressures in life too and I had also just a year about a year before that maybe um started therapy and mm -hmm. started realizing I had emotions I really didn't think I had them I was like wow the first time I sat down on my therapist couch I told her you know, I don't think I have emotions. And they told me in seminary that you got to work your stuff out before you're going to help other people. So I probably have some stuff to work out. And then I realized. Wow, what, I, that's so amazing because although it sounds strange, mm -hmm. uh, it is really not that uncommon for people not to realize. Right. Either they don't realize they have emotions or I've, and I've heard this, people say, I, I don't, I'm not in touch with my emotions which is yeah. kind of the same thing, right? Yes. Yeah, totally. I think, and that's what it was. It's like being taught that it's being in our mind. That's what we do. And especially in America, that it's, we're individualized, we're mind thinkers, we're in our, we live in our mind, mm -hmm. not in our bodies and in our emotions. Um, mm -hmm. So it was just a lot that was going on and it just resulted in, I just wanted to get out. I wanted to not have to deal with mm -hmm. anything that was going on. So suicidal thoughts came into my mind. And then I lived with them and they grew in intensity for about four or five years. They just, and then I would 
go almost and have almost every single day. Sometimes it would be like hours on end. I would just imagine how I would kill myself. And Mm -hmm. I happen to have thought about several different ways Uh and different people are different. Some people will have one or two methods that Uh they're, those are the methods that they're going to use. Other people have more, but there's certain methods that I would never use. So I got really interested in why, why that, why these particular things, why are these ones in my head? And at, through therapy and also through just talking to my friends, I've, I feel like I'm, I'm I don't want to say lucky, but mm. in some kinds of ways, I have a part of me that is really um, wanting to be in life and wanting to be here. So I kept talking about it. Okay. And you did, and out. you did have someone to talk. So, you, were your friends open to talk about these things? And and also, were they in the same place? I mean, would they think about suicide too? Because and, and the reason I, why I'm asking is I, I was looking at uh, new research showing that it's one of the leading causes of of death in college students in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Fifty seven thousand uh, students were interviewed, and twenty percent said that they had suicidal thoughts. Yeah, that's a lot. So it is. Yeah, I um, talked mostly at first to therapists, and I happened to have a lot of minister friends because I went to seminary, so there was a lot mm-hmm. of minister friends around, mm-hmm. and I talked to some of them. I learned that I could not talk to my family about it because my mom would freak out. Oh. She's much better now. She's much more supportive. We've really worked mm-hmm. through that. Um, Good. And then I was in school, in graduate school to get a counseling degree. So then most of my friends were in school to get a counseling degree. So I could talk to them about it. They were okay with it. But Mm -hmm. only one or two also struggled with suicidal thoughts. So most of them actually didn't. Mm -hmm. But I kept talking about it. And I'm not really sure what part of me that was. But I just kept talking. And do you find that it helped? Just being Absolutely. able to talk about it. Is that why you decided to work with this population? Yeah, that's part of it. The fact that when I was able to talk about it, it released pressure. And then I didn't have, it became less intense when I was able to verbalize it. Mm-hmm. And to have somebody sit there and hear me and be with me and to not try to change what I was doing. When they got afraid or were, would freak out, then it made it worse. Oh, that's so, that's so important to emphasize because it's one of the main things that happen, isn't it? It's the same with suicide when someone dies. The moment you talk about it, if someone judges, if they come from a place of right and wrong, if they want to lecture you in any way, it just makes things worse. So what would you say to someone who hears that from, from a friend or a family member? I would say if you can, recognize that that's their fear that they're just afraid and they have no idea what to do and try to give it back to them give back their fear and then go find the supportive person that you need find Mm -hmm. the person who can listen to you who can listen without judgment and talk to them Mm -hmm. i i read on the website and then um that you said something, I think it was something like, I learned how to listen to my suicidal thoughts. What does that mean? Yes. So um, when, so I uh, used depth therapy at first, and now I use internal family systems. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I took every method that I thought of. So when I thought about taking pills, Mm -hmm. I sat with the the feeling and the images, I had a lot of images, like I literally would imagine myself taking pills. Mm-hmm. Um, and I sat with them and just let them be there. And then what happened was underneath that, I realized that the pain that was there or what I needed was I really, really wanted relief. And when you think about taking pills, it's usually for pain relief. So it's the emotional pain relief that I was trying to get from imagining of taking pills just wanting to have my body emotionally be relieved Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so then when I realized that that there's a message behind the pills then I could actually take that and translate it into a self-care so then how how can I have emotional rest without Mm -hmm. killing myself 
what does so, that look like? So, so looking for ways to maybe tame that emotion at the time or that fear. I mean, what is the message behind this? I mean, why am I afraid? What is making me feel this way? And then looking for another option. Yeah, yeah. So it's really like listening, listening to, okay, this is the method that's coming up. And mm -hmm. pills for me happen to be, I'm emotionally exhausted and I want out. Mm -hmm. What can I do in my life? Can I go and I really like nature and hiking and that really restores me. Can I go on a hike or sit with a tree? Or maybe I really physically do need to take a nap mm -hmm. and just sleep or go swimming because that really helps. And then I started to realize that the other methods also meant other things. So when I thought about uh, using a knife and either cutting on my arm or on my neck, that those, it was usually because I felt this um, intensity and almost like toxicity inside my body. Like I was just, I mm -hmm. felt toxic and I just wanted it to get out. Mm -hmm. I just would like imagine like cutting and the, imagine mm -hmm. it coming out something like how can I get it out and then realized okay so if it's about being toxic it's about this I need this kind of release mm -hmm. then what I need to do is actually usually more physical running mm -hmm. swimming I don't actually like to run walking <laughs> swimming like I don't blame uh, <laughs> I tried yeah. it didn't work <laughs> yeah how can I help that mm -hmm. uh, pent-up toxic feeling yeah and move yeah. and be really working too. yeah yeah mm -hmm. and then like every single one I realized that it ha had this these messages so that's part of why I created a group around suicide for people who have chronic suicide specifically people who have like lived with suicidal thoughts for so much of their life and it's just constantly there mm. maybe they've acted mm -hmm. on them maybe they haven't but there's deeper messages there. Yeah, you know, you, you're talking about this. And I remember when I had a book signing, uh, there was this couple, he was much young, younger than she was. And I, can't, I could tell, because nobody comes to book signings on, unless you know the author, right? Because it's the yeah. most boring, let's be honest. It's the most boring thing on earth. <laughs> <laughs> so only your friends will be there and family members. But I saw that, that there was something happening and they were coming closer to me. And the moment they, they arrived, I got up because I knew it was going to be intense. And mm -hmm. I, I went up to them and, and he said, I brought my mom here today because I saw, you know, I read about the book signing, but she has been having suicidal thoughts all her life and it's getting yeah. so, so much worse. And I just wanted her to see that there is a way out. And he started crying. Mm -hmm. And it was just so moving to me. I think that was the first time that I had really contact with someone who was living with that mm -hmm. for so long. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you see a lot of that in your patients and, and groups. What do you hear from them? Is it, is it something when you start sharing, is it, is it very similar or do you hear very, very different experiences? How does that work? Um, it's, there are some similarities, but it's also, I think, an individual thing. But mostly what I hear is that because I talk about it so much, especially in the group, and because it's um, such an open experience, and I'm not making it a big deal, it is, of course, mm -hmm. there's some seriousness to it. Of but some course. of them have told me it's just so nice just to be, have a light conversation about it, mm -hmm. like how you and I are talking about it, just a mm -hmm. regular, normal conversation. And it doesn't have to be this Oh my goodness, Scary. you told me about suicide. What yeah. am I going to do? I have to assess you and what am I going to do? Call 911. Like, right? Yeah. Everybody does. Can yeah. Relax and we can explore the story and explore what's underneath it. That seems to be a really important part of helping people. Um, it's like the, it's releasing that pressure and that intensity to have to hold it inside and mm -hmm. making it bigger than it maybe is. So it's maybe not as big as some of us think it is. Yeah. And also, even if it is, because of course we have to always take it seriously. Right. But to be able to talk to someone and know they're not going to panic. 
Right. They're not going to lock you up. They're not going to send you to a hospital, but they're actually just going to sit with you and and talk about it and hear where your pain comes from, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Stay there with them. And what do you find, Heidi? uh, What do you find that works best? I mean, when you have a new patient or a new group member, what are the interventions? Because I I would love to help this population, people who are listening. Mm -hmm and who have suicidal thoughts, I mean, what can help them? What are the, the main things that you can suggest for them? Yeah. So what I've talked about so far is something that took me a long time to get to and to figure out and translate into something. But then I actually found something called internal family systems, mm-hmm. which is about the fact that we all have different parts of ourselves. And that we can work f- with the different parts of ourselves from a uh, what we would call self energy or this co- compassionate space and this space of gratitude. Mm-hmm. This is the thing that, beyond anything else, has changed my life more than anything. So, I have worked with my suicidal parts quite a bit and mm-hmm. have so much gratitude. It's the gratitude part. Mm. that I can see what they're doing for me. They are working so hard to protect me. They want to keep me safe. They want to do anything they can to keep me out of pain. Mm. So when I know that that's what they're doing, that that's that's like the main, that's the big headliner um, message. Mm, I want to keep you out of pain. I can get you out of this if you die. Wow. Since I know that, and they pop, when they pop up, when they come into my awareness, I can have enough separation from them. So they're a part of me. They're not all of me. So I'm separate from them. Mm-hmm. And then I can look at them and be, and it's a deep gratitude. It's this, it comes from deep within of, I am so thankful that you showed up. Thank mm-hmm. you for letting, for working so hard to keep me out of pain. Yeah. I see you and I appreciate you. And I also can be with the other parts of me that have all that pain in the same way I'm with you. So it's okay. And I've got them. Mm. So then the suicidal parts can back off and then I can go and work with the parts of me that have that pain. And that pain can come from past traumas. It can come from life experiences. It can come from a lot of different places, but then I can, it's working with those parts um, for in myself and also with clients to help them release the burden and release the trauma that they've been carrying because then the suicidal part doesn't even need to come in anymore because it's not trying to protect against that pain mm-hmm. and this has been it's really felt like magic to me so when I started working with them I worked with my suicidal parts a lot mm-hmm. we did a lot of boundaries a lot of you would think of that as like the safety planning the protecting uh-huh how are like making sure that that's the suicidal part isn't going to jump into the action Mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience just this week, actually, where I moved through a suicidal moment in two minutes and landed in a grounded, I have got myself, I've got any pain that might potentially come up, which Mm -hmm. just feels like I didn't even think it was possible to go that quickly. Mm. But it is. But it, it, and it's so important to emphasize this because it's not going to happen over time, right? Yeah. It takes, you are rewiring your brain. You're establishing yeah. new connections in your brain. Right, exactly. Because that's where it's going to happen. And it does take time. And uh, mm-hmm. if you're listening to this, just be patient and keep going from what I understand of what you said. It's keeping a balance between thoughts are not me. Yes. Emotions are part of me, but they don't dictate my life. So have a conversation, keep a distance from them and try to understand why they're here. Mm -hmm. And it it can actually be used for any emotion that people call bad emotion because they're all here, as you said, to protect us. Absolutely. Fear is us is here to protect us. Anxiety is here to protect us. Yep. So why why is that happening? Why am I afraid? Why am I getting scared? Why am I thinking about suicide? 
Mm -hmm. What is bothering? What is, why is this hurting so much? And yeah. get to the bottom of what's, of what's happening internally to you that can be caused by external, of course, Absolutely. as you said, crisis and everything, but to keep this balance in, in distancing yourself from it. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that what you said? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it can work with so many different aspects in life. Mm -hmm. And how long do you, do you find that it starts working with your groups and your patients? I know it's individual, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely individual and it depends on the person. It also depends on their ability to, um, to trust themselves it's really getting to this aspect of being able to trust themselves. So at first it's a lot of, uh, we have to build a relationship between them and myself, mm -hmm. making sure that they trust me and that the space feels safe. Uh -huh. And then what I'm trying to do is to help. It's, so there's this, um, is it towards me and you would be horizontal. This is vertical. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a moment. Yeah, it's a common doubt. It's okay. <laughs> right. So the, you know how, I, how it works for me hmm. when, I, when I have the same doubt because the horizon. I said, yeah. Horizon. Think about the sea. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the horizontal connection is important mm -hmm. to establish trust. And then as a therapist, I'm working, can we also have a vertical connection so that the, their trust can be built inside them so that they don't necessarily need me but I'm a strong um, post for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, as far as how long it takes, some I work with complex trauma, so it yes. uh -huh. so can take some time. Longer. Yeah, sure. But it also, we can have those moments of um, that gratitude, that compassion, that can come up within two, one, two, three sessions. It really depends on the person. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a huge, important piece. It's a shift, isn't it? Yeah. If there can be gratitude and compassion toward any part of ourself, mm -hmm. then it's just growing that towards the parts that are maybe a little bit harder, mm -hmm. the suicidal parts, the parts that hold a lot of trauma or a lot of depression, the parts mm -hmm. that are really intense. It might take longer to have the same amount of compassion towards them. But if we start with maybe a part that's not as hard or, or maybe a part that's anxious or, you know, something that's not as big. Uh -huh. Feeling what that gratitude. You, when you talked about the vertical, it made me think about the body. So mm -hmm. how do you integrate the body part too? Because that's where it, it expresses itself to trauma, right. especially complex trauma, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So how do you work with that? How do you incorporate that? So our parts live in different parts of our body. So I actually literally just ask when we're talking about maybe a suicidal part. So you know that the suicidal part shows up and it brings you these particular thoughts and this is kind of what's showing up. Where do you experience that in or around your body? And most people will know. Mm. I have two suicidal parts. I have one who lives in my brain mm. and the other one right now, he is in my brain, but he moves around everywhere. They're also like, they literally look like people to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how you refer to them, right? Right. They have names and mm -hmm. everything. So it's yeah. like a whole little system. It helps, it helps keep, it, keep it outside of you too, doesn't right. it? Yeah. When yeah. You give, it a, give it a name. Yeah. Yeah. So you do work with the, with the body part too, because that's important. Yeah. Yeah. So it's generally what I find is that um, the pain which is usually younger parts, they're also like aged mm -hmm. at different things, is generally mm -hmm. held more in the stomach area. Mm -hmm. Usually that's more where we hold trauma, maybe in our hips, somewhere around there. Yeah. Anxiety is generally held in the chest, yeah. maybe the head. Yeah. There's a lot of head parts. Uh -huh. A lot of um, headache when you have anxiety, yeah. right? Right. And tension in this area of your yep. neck. Yep. A lot of the neck. Upper body. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, anything else that you find is important to, to mention today that we haven't covered? I think the other thing that's important to mention is in my entire process of doing this, I used a safety plan, which was a really important piece for me. I know some people like safety plans, some people don't like safety plans, mm -hmm. um, but can the safety plan... Can you explain what safety plans 
Uh, yeah. What, what could they look like for different people? Yeah. Yeah. So a safety plan for me is a working document. So it was never a static one kind of thing, but it has, it has certain questions on it. So it has what are, what happens before the suicidal thoughts? It's like what kind of emotions or feelings or Triggers. thoughts? Yeah. So like, so that you can know, oh, these are the things that bring on the suicidal thoughts. Okay. okay. So when I'm experiencing that, then you mm -hmm. have other steps that you can move through to try to help ground yourself or distract yourself depending on what it is. So that I always had people I could reach out to, to distract me. So people on my safety plan who I didn't talk to about suicide, mm -hmm. but I just was like, Hey, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Want to go for a walk? <laughs> can you send me a cute cat picture? Yeah. Yeah. Can you send me something like something that you have those, whatever. right? Who has right. hundreds yeah. of things on their phone. Right. Yeah. Just <laughs> so, something that to try to distract and get away, get away from it for a moment to alleviate some of the mm -hmm. intensity, especially when they're running in your head all of the time, it can be exhausting to have suicidal thoughts mm -hmm. that often. Um, so there's the distracting part, who can do that? There's where can I go or what can I do by myself that doesn't include anybody else? Can I go swimming? Can I go hiking? Can I go to a coffee shop? Is there somewhere that I can physically go to remove myself from where I'm at right now? Because mm -hmm. sometimes just the shift in environment can help uh -huh. change thoughts mm -hmm. um trying those things if those things don't work who can i reach out to in my support community and talk about suicidal thoughts who can i talk to that i trust will hold me and not judge mm -hmm. and i actually at one point had a text of three of my friends all who happen to be counselors in my counseling program that I asked if I could just text them when I'm having thoughts yeah. and Do what it. I need. So and generally it was like, yeah. suicidal thoughts are here again. I'm going to go for a walk. Sometimes okay. I just, just let them know. I mean, and right. it makes you feel safe that you know that someone knows, right? Yeah. And then I, then I didn't have to hold it as much on my own. Mm -hmm. um, but then my safety plan also had my therapist on it, my professional sure. contacts. Who could what about call? method? Would you remove methods too? Because that's an important one for safety plan. Um, I did have that a couple of times. There were a few times when I froze my pills so I couldn't get to them. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah. And then another thing I did on my safety plan, which is different, I don't think anybody else has done it, is all of those, um, that what I was talking about earlier, the here's the particular method, here's the mm -hmm. message, and here's the self-care. I wrote every single one of those down so that I could quickly look at it and be like, oh, right. I'm thinking about pills. I need to go so, take it. So a shortcut. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't have to do it every single time again. Okay. Good. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Heidi, for sharing your story. And where can people find you? Uh, so I, my practice name is Self Grounded Therapy. I have a website, selfgroundedtherapy.org. If you, I'm also on Psychology Today. If you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. put in Heidi Lindeman, you'll find me. Yeah. Um, I'm on Facebook as Self Grounded Therapy. I'm starting a YouTube right now. I have two posts right there. You <laughs> also can get to those through my website, though. Sure. <laughs> or my yeah, Facebook. Yeah, so the website is the best. The website's yeah, the best. Because yes, it, has all, all the, it has all the links. All the, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, have a good day. I don't know what it looks like outside. Everyone is quarantined right now. So I'm looking here. It's very sunny here in Portland, Oregon. What it's is it very like snowy with? here. We've got oh. we had a big snowstorm the other day. It's okay. Snow's my favorite and I love it. Oh, really? It. Oh, my God. I can't We're all quarantined. I'm Brazilian. I'm Brazilian. <laughs> I can't deal with it. I don't know what to do with snow except for taking pictures. I take one and two and then go, okay, done. Yeah. <laughs> Melt, please. Yeah. We're all quarantined, so we can't go anywhere anyway. So yeah. well, okay. It's Thank you gorgeous. so much, Heidi. Thank you so much. It was Welcome a pleasure. To us. I, I am really sure this will be so helpful for my audience and for I hope so. struggling with this right now. Um, yeah. Gave great ideas and, and great suggestions. Thank you. Thank you Have so much. Have a good day and stay safe, huh? I will, you too. <laughs>